Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we spent the past week talking about magnetic fields, which are made by moving charges. And we used, uh, as a source of moving charges, we used <coughs> wires in a, in a circuit that had a current flowing through it, uh, moving electrons. And we didn't really talk much about how circuits work, just that you connect them and current flows and that you they're moving electrons and we, we got a magnetic field produced by those electrons. And you saw in lab that the magnetic field was in a simple circuit was on the order of the Earth's magnetic field and produced compass deflections that you could use to measure the magnetic field. Our agenda for the next couple of weeks is to understand in more detail how circuits work. Um, and in particular, this week, understand in a fundamental way at a microscopic level what's going on in the circuit in an, in an in an electric circuit. And we're going to talk about really simple circuits, batteries and bulbs, because it's it's easiest to see the principles, the applications in a circuit like that. Now we're not actually going to introduce any brand new physics. Um, the physics we're going to be talking about using, the ideas that we're going to be talking about to understand circuits are ideas that we've already developed. So we're going to be talking about charge and electric field and energy and the properties of conductors. They're all concepts that we're, we're familiar with. This gives us a chance to use them in a pretty interesting context since electric circuits are a key part of our lives and even what we're doing right now. Um, and also to understand in detail something that's that's um, important, not just in terms of physics, but technology uh, in our current current lives. So that's that's the goal. Among the questions we're going to be trying to answer is, um, does something get used up in a circuit? If so, what is it? Uh, how is it possible to maintain a non-zero electric field in a conductor? And what exactly does a battery do in a circuit? So those are questions we're gonna, gonna be exploring. We're gonna end up with a lot of, uh, we will be doing some mathematics, but we will end up with a lot of qualitative reasoning, which is still gonna be rigorous and important, uh, but will help us understand what we're doing and talking about circuits. <clears throat> So, so here is um, a circuit of the kind we're, we're talking about. So we have a, a battery, just one battery, wires connected to the, the ends of the battery and connected to a socket in which there's a light bulb and the light bulb is on and if I disconnect the wire from the battery, the light bulb goes out. So, so that's the circuit we're, we're talking about at the moment. Um, so let's just do a little bit of reasoning about this circuit. Um, So here's a, here's a circuit with current flowing in the circuit. Um, and this end of the battery, the right end of the battery in this, the way the picture is oriented has a negative sign. That's the negative pole of the battery. The, the other end, the left end is a positive sign. That's the positive end of the battery. And electrons are moving through the circuit to light the bulb, just like we last we just saw. And so our quest, the first question is, at location A, um, what what is the direction of the velocity of electrons in that wire?
Okay, well, you said either three or four, and I think that's probably just an issue of which way the wire is really oriented at that location. Um, so both both three and four indicate that the electrons would be would be flowing away from the north from the uh, sorry negative end of the battery toward the light bulb, uh, and that's that's absolutely the right answer. So um, I think that. Uh, I probably would have said four because I think that that I would try to draw a line that's 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 tangent to the to the wire at that point since the electrons are flowing through the wire and to me that looks more like four. But I think if you said three, you pro probably what you meant. Um, okay, so that's right. And just for completeness. Um, Let's consider a situation where, let's consider location B, which is on the other side of the light bulb. And the question is, what's the, what's the velocity, the direction of the velocity of, of electrons flowing through the circuit when the light bulb's lit at location B? And uh, and you said six, which of course is a an extremely sensible answer. Um, so um, so again, the electrons are going to be flowing in the direction the wire is pointing, and so at that location, they're going to be traveling in the direction of the wire. Now it must be the case actually in this circuit that if electrons are flowing through this this metal remember that we we know that the the average drift speed uh, is proportional to the the magnitude of the electric field in the wire uh, and this proportionality constant is the the mobility. Um, and that's why some objects are better conductors than others, because they just have higher mobility. So, uh, so silver is a better, gold is a better conductor than iron, just because the, the electron mobility is higher. Um, so this implies, actually, that if the drift speed is not zero, um, so if the drift speed is greater than zero, that implies that the magnitude of the net electric field, I'm going to write E net, inside the wire is also not zero. And this means that we're not at equilibrium. We are in the the steady state where where the drift speed is constant but not zero. <clears throat> um, okay. So then the next interesting thing to think about is in this steady state, let's consider the same circuit, the one we have been talking about here. How does the electron current at location A compare to the electron current at location B? That is, so electron current is number of electrons per second entering a section of conductor, right? And so the question is, how does the electron current at location A, the number of electrons per second passing location A, compare to the number of electrons per second passing location B in this circuit? So 
So we'll talk in a minute about what what happens in the in the filament of the light bulb and why the light bulb is is giving off light. Okay, because that's an important question. So the most popular answer is two, which is that um, the the number of electrons per second passing location A going in in that direction, I sub little i sub A, is actually equal to the number of electrons per second passing location B. And that indeed is the correct answer. But let's see why um, why the other two alternatives don't make sense physically. Okay. So, so how what would have to happen if um, if we had let's say three times ten to the eighteenth electrons per second passing location A and only two times ten to the eighteenth electrons per second passing location B. <clears throat> well, that would mean that that we've lost, that, that something has happened to 10 to the 18th electrons in one second. So if we look in one second, somehow something has happened to, to 10, 10 to the 18th electrons. So what could happen to them? Can the electrons be used up? Well, there are ways to, so conservation of charge, says that we can't just destroy, we can't just destroy electrons, okay, without destroying something else that's positive. Um, So we know of one, one interaction that, that would destroy an electron. If we have an electron plus an anti-electron, a positron, those two things can react and annihilate. They destroy each other. And that just, remember, that just produces two, two photons. We, we write them as, as gamma gamma rays because they're kind of high energy photons. But do we have antimatter in this wire? Uh, we know we don't because antimatter reacts so quickly with ordinary matter that the wire would not be there if there were antimatter in the wire. So, so we can rule that out. Um, so we, we can't, we can't we can't, we can't think of a way to actually use up electrons without destroying something else that's, that's, that's positive. Yeah, we do hope there's no antimatter in the wire. So could electrons just pile up in the bulb? After all, the, the filament in a light bulb, if you've ever looked at an incandescent light bulb, is, is very narrow. And so it must be harder to get a lot of electrons through. Could they, could they just pile up in the bulb? Well, the problem is the bulb would get very, very negative. And if the bulb became negative, so suppose we had negative charges here building up in this bulb, well, that would create an electric field that would actually repel incoming electrons. And this, this incoming current would actually decrease because electrons were being repelled. Um, so this would um, repel incoming electrons, the current would decrease. And that's not the steady state. Okay, we don't see the bulb getting dimmer and dimmer. So it looks like 
this can't happen either. <clears throat> so we're left with the conclusion that there, there just isn't any reasonable way for there to be, to be fewer electrons per second um, coming out of the bulb than went into the bulb. But it does seem like something must be used up in the bulb, actually. What, what's making all that light? Well, let's think about, well, if they're, so they could be moving more slowly, but if they're moving more slowly, um, then you have fewer electrons per second, right? So you have the same number of electrons, but if they're moving more slowly, then you're still going to have fewer electrons per second at location B. And therefore, somehow the electrons are going to have to pile up at, at location A, I mean, in the bulb. Okay, so there's no way for them to be moving slower at B and give the same current they move slower in B, you'd have a lower current and you'd still have electrons piling up in the bulb, um, a traffic jam, if you like, in the bulb. <clears throat> so what's happening actually is that, that there is something, you, it's clear there's something happening in the bulb. And what's happening is that informally, we could say that what's being used up in the bulb is actually energy. Um, so, um, you know that if you rub your hands together, some of the energy goes into just making your hands hot, right? And so some energy is going into to making, so some energy, kinetic energy of electrons goes into heating the bulb. So, heating the, the filament, which a filament is just a wire. The film, light bulb filaments and incandescent bulbs are usually made of tungsten. And they're very, 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 very thin. They have very, very small diameters. And we'll talk about why that's desirable. So what happens here is that actually electrons who are, which are moving through a metal, remember our model of a metal is, is we have these, um, these positive atomic cores, which is the, the nucleus and, and all the electrons except one. And that one electron is given up to the mobile electron C. So here come some electrons moving through this. Well, the these atomic the atoms in the metal are actually vibrating. And so they're moving, they're not always staying in the same place. And so sometimes electrons actually collide with, with these atomic cores. And when they collide, they lose kinetic energy. And the, the atoms vibrate more. <clears throat> and that essentially is what resistance is. This is what we call resistance. It's a it's a kind of, it, you can think of it as a kind of friction. It's a way energy is dissipated. So, um, so a profile of, of, a, of an electron moving through a wire might look like something like this. So this is the, the speed and this is time. And Suppose there's an electric field here. So it's an electric field is, is constant in this, in this wire, in this metal. 
So what happens to the electron? Well, it's subject to an electric field, so it speeds up and speeds up and speeds up, and then it collides with one of these atomic cores, and it loses its kinetic energy, but that electric field is still there. So it starts to move again, and it speeds up and speeds up and speeds up, and then it collides with a core, and so there's this accelerate and stop, accelerate and stop motion. Um, as a function of time. And so when we talk about the drift speed of electrons, the reason we write it as an average drift speed is that what we're actually talking about is the, the average speed, which might, um, maybe that's actually too high for the way I drew it, but we can eyeball a, an average speed here. Let's call that V average. <clears throat> Now, what happens to a metal when it gets hot? Well, the atoms are moving, and we have, as we remember from last semester, these, these uh, spring mass oscillators. And remember that in these microscopic spring mass oscillators, the energy of the oscillator is quantized, so it comes in discrete steps. And when an oscillator starts, an atom starts to oscillate more, it can lose energy by emitting a photon. And so the, the photons we see coming out of the light bulb, the visible photons, and the ones we can feel with our hands, the infrared photons, are due to the fact that these atoms in the filament have been excited and they're vibrating more and they lose energy by emitting photons. So some of the kinetic energy of the electrons going through that, <clears throat> filament is, is actually being converted into thermal energy of the, the, the atoms in the lattice, and then they can emit energy in the form of photons. And so what is, what is this? So remember, we had this equation V drift equals U E, where E is the magnitude of the electron field, the electric field. The mobility um, actually depends on the temperature. And it also depends on the material, the exact structure. Um, so how much, how, how well electrons, how big a, an average drift speed they can achieve and how, um, how much, quote, resistance, if you like, or friction there is, um, depends on the particular material and also the temperature of the material. <clears throat> so we can actually write down, um, so we, 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 our reasoning involved um, two ideas. Uh, the fact that there was a, that we were in a steady state. And that um, the, the charge had to be conserved. And that resulted in us concluding that, that the electron current coming into the bulb had to be equal to the electron current coming out of the bulb. And this is sometimes dignified by a name specific to circuits. It's called the current node rule. And what's a node? Well, a node is just someplace in a circuit where, where you're interested in how much is coming in and how much is, is going out. And we can write it as, um, that in the steady state, the sum of the number of electrons per second coming into a node is equal to the sum of the electrons per second going out of a node. So even if we had more than one thing happening, a wire comes in and then another wire goes this way and another wire goes this way, and we decide this is a node because we're interested in 
in what happens here. So we could say if this is I1 and this is I2 and that's I3, um, then we would say the current coming in I1 has to be equal to, well, the current going out has to be equal to the current coming in, so it would be I2 plus I3. So if I2 was 3 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second, and I3 was 4 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second, then this would have to be 7 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second. Um, okay. So is the current always going to be the same everywhere in the steady state circuit? Um, and let's 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 think here about um, so what what let's let's just apply what we've been talking about to this. So here we have a circuit, and it, the wires are drawn with some thickness, so you can see the diameters of the wire. And there's there's wire one on the left has a cross sectional area, so this is the the cross-sectional area A1, and the wire on the right has the area A2. And let's think about, from what we've seen, what has to be true in this, in this circuit in the steady state. So how does the current in wire one number of electrons per second compare to the Now be careful about the question. I'm asking you the number of electrons per second. I'm not saying is anything different in these two wires. I'm saying is the number of electrons per second passing through these wires different? So here's what you said. And the most popular answer is that I1 equals I2 and that has to be correct <clears throat> from everything we've just talked about. Um, because we can't destroy electrons, as we said before. Um, if they build up, you're not going to, the, the current will change and it won't be a steady state. <clears throat> so, in fact, we must have exactly <clears> the <throat> same number of electrons per second coming through the thick wire is the thin wire. Now the question really is, if that bothers, it's, it's not unreasonable to say, but how can that happen? And so here's, here's what we need to think about. Um, we, so presumably electrons are actually moving in that direction away from the, the negative, <clears throat> terminal of the battery and, and toward the positive terminal. <clears throat> so let's see how can that happen. <clears throat> well, let's go back to an expression we derived for electron current. So remember that the number of electrons per second was equal to the density of mobile electrons and I gather from lab that, that uh, and other things that some of you have not uh, paid enough attention to the meaning of these symbols in these questions. So this is the mobile electrons per cubic meter <clears throat> times A, which is the cross-sectional area of the wire. times V, which is the, the average drift speed. <clears throat> so 
So let's assume these, these wires are made of the same material. Okay, so same material. So if I1 equals I2, then N A1 V1 has to equal N A2 V2, right? I'll draw. <clears throat> Um, so we know that, that it's made of the same material, the, the ends are the same. And that suggests that if, that if A1 is clearly greater than A2, the cross-sectional area of wire one is clearly greater than A2, that must mean that V1 must actually be less than V2 in order for these two products to be equal. So we're going to get the same number of electrons per second, but they're traveling at different speeds in wires with different, different uh, cross-sectional area. So does that make sense? So now we have a new question, which is, um, so we have a new question. How can the speeds be different? <clears throat> write that so it's clear it's a V. How can V1 be less than V2? Well, now we're back to, to thinking about, uh, so we have another, another equation here. Um, remember that the drift speed, the average drift speed was equal to the mobility of mobile electrons in a material times the magnitude of the electric field the net electric field inside that material. Um, well, that's the, the wires are the same material, so the, so the U's are the same. And this must mean actually that the electric field, so we conclude that, that the magnitude of the electric field in wire one must actually be less than the magnitude of the electric field in wire two. And now we're interested in how that happens. So you may wonder why we're we talking about electric field. Why do you need an electric field at all? So why do we need... <clears throat> um, well, we need an electric field in terms of our previous argument because if electrons keep colliding with the metal and losing energy, then we need to, they need to gain energy again. And so they need to have, there needs to be an electric field inside the wire. Um, but why, why can't, you know, can't electrons just push each other through the wire? So, so sometimes people use a peas in a straw analogy. You know, you're pushing peas through a straw and one pea pushes the other. That's actually a deeply flawed analogy. Electrons can't push each other through the wire because let's think about what we know about what's inside the wire. So here's, here's an electron inside the wire. And suppose there's another electron here, so we'll call this one and that two. Now, it's absolutely true that electron two is going to repel electron one. Yep, they sure do. So that's 
the force on one by two. But what else is inside this wire? What else is inside this wire? Well, there's probably another electron over here. We'll call this guy three. And so there's going to be a force on one by three. And we're just getting started because then there are all these positive atomic cores in, in the wire. And so the electron is going to be, you know, attracted to, to this core. It's going to be attracted to that core. Um, and the thing we know is that the interior of a conductor is neutral. If there's any excess charge, it has to be on the surface. So, so the things inside the wire um, have to add up to net zero charge. And so then the, the forces they exert on each other, in fact, have to cancel out. So, um, so that kind of doesn't work. So we need an electric field to be applied by, by charges outside. So external charges, we'll say. Um, so let's see how big a field we might need. Uh, if the drift speed is the mobility times the magnitude of the electric field, then the electric field is going to be the drift speed over the mobility. And we, we've already seen that drift speeds are on the order of something like 10 to the minus fifth meters per second. Um, mobilities are on the order of something like 4.5 times 10 to the minus third meters per second per Newton per Coulomb. And so we'd get a, an electric field needed in this particular wire of something like 0.011 Newtons per Coulomb, not a real big field, but it needs to be there. And this suggests that in our in our example here of, um, of a circuit with wires of different uh, cross-sectional area. So we realized we now we, we can go back and say, well, if I1 equals I2, and there we said that A1, V1 had to be equal to a2, V2, and so V2, so A1, we said A1 was greater than A2, so V1 was less than V2. To get a, a bigger, a bigger uh, drift speed here, we need a bigger electric field. So at a, this, in a location like this, for example, if our if our drift speed of electrons is that, that, like at this location, it might be, so this is V1 and that's V2. Well, we need a proportionally larger electric field in this piece of the circuit. So we need, since the force on electrons is opposite to the electric field, we would need a big electric field here and a a smaller electric field. Um, this is E1, isn't it? That's E2. These are ones. <clears throat> okay. So the question is, basically, the question we're now left with is, is how do we do this? So let's actually just practice on one question before we before we so 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 we actually don't know we don't know yet how we can achieve that okay so that's kind of a mystery but we know it has to be true 
So let's actually practice on a situation, uh, a question here where we can think about this. So the first, the first step is, is this. So here's our, our circuit that we've been looking at. And we'll see the cross-sectional area A1 is four times um, the cross-sectional area of, eight, of, of two, okay? So let's see what we can conclude about what has to be true logically, even if we don't quite understand yet how we're gonna manage to do that. Okay, I'm gonna just fix it by hand. I think this should be a V, so that's a V2. <clears throat> so you said that um, V1 was less than V2, obviously because the cross-sectional area is bigger, and that um, in fact, since A1 is four times as big as A2, then V1 had to be only a fourth as large as V2, and that's that's absolutely correct. So, so that's the, that's indeed the right answer. Okay, let's take it one step further. Um, in the same situation, since we concluded, we made that conclusion about, uh, the drift speeds, what do we conclude about the electric field inside the wires here? It's where E1 means the electric field inside of wire one, and E2 means the electric field inside of wire two. Okay. So you correctly say that if the speed at two has to be greater than the speed at one, then the electric field at, at two has to be greater than the electric field at one. And so that says that we have this picture we drew before, which is if we have to have a bigger speed here then here, then that's going to take a bigger electric field here than there. And in fact, since the cross-sectional areas differ by a factor of four, it's going to be a factor of four. Okay, so we know that we need different electric fields in different parts of the circuit. And we know that the interior of, of so we, we know Need, need, we need an electric field inside the circuit. And we know that, that the interior of the wire is neutral. And we know that the charges make electric fields. So the question is, where are the charges? The e and V are not equal and opposite because, um, first of all, uh, they have totally different, they have different units. But remember that E and V are related by V equals the mobility times the electric field, right? So V is proportional to the electric field to the magnitude of the electric field, but it's this, and that's this mobility, this is property of the material that, that is the proportionality constant. So if you said V is directly proportional, so the, the, the speed is directly proportional to the magnitude of the electric field and the direction the direction is different just because because f equals 
QE, right? And that these are electrons. So the force is in, but the force applied on the electron by the electric field is opposite to the field, right? Okay, so to think about this, we're gonna think about a, a kind of a, a toy um, circuit. So let me explain this and yeah, we can do this. So let me explain what we're looking at here. So this is uh, a circuit, well, let me back up first. So one, one thought about where the charges are that, that, um, that create the electric field uh, inside the wires is that it, it's gotta have something to do with the battery, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if the charges can't be inside the wires, then maybe they're on the battery. So here's our, here's our circuit and the bulb is, is lit. Okay, whoops, it was lit until I jiggled the wire. Um, there we go. Now the bulb is lit. And so it's sort of reasonable to think that the, the charges would be on the battery besides there's, there's one pole of the battery that's labeled plus and the other pole of the battery that's labeled minus. So, so surely there's some charge on those ends of the battery. And in fact, it means the battery looks kind of like a dipole, doesn't it? So if it's got positive charges on one end and negative charge on the other end, then it's probably making a dipole, kind of a dipole field. Well, if that's the case, then we know the dipole field falls off like one over distance cubed. So if I move the light bulb 10 times closer to the battery, um, then it ought to get a thousand times brighter, right? Because the electrons would be going a thousand times faster. So if I move it from 10 centimeters away to one centimeter away, we don't really see any change in brightness of the bulb. And in fact, if it got 10,000 times brighter, that would be pretty exciting. And furthermore, if it's, this is a dipole field, presumably the, let's see, this is, this is the negative end, that's the positive end. So the field would be pointing that way inside the light bulb. So if I rotate the light bulb 90 degrees, it should go out and it doesn't do that. So it looks like there's got to be more to it than just charges on the battery, although there clearly are. There's no question there actually are charges on the battery. So let's see if we can think through where, reason through where these charges have to be. <clears throat> um, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, a model circuit, if you like, where these lines are, these lines here are, this is a wire, okay? And the wire actually has some bends in it. It's kind of a snaky wire. And instead of a battery, what we've got is kind of a mechanical battery. So this is a, it's a capacitor and it's got positive charge on the left plate, negative charge on the right plate. And then we have a little conveyor belt um, that, that moves electrons so electrons are gonna flow off the negative plate. We wanna keep the charge on the capacitor the same. So we have a little conveyor belt with a crank and, and these, these little wheels can rotate here and drive the conveyor belt. And the energy input is you, you're turning the crank, okay? And so let's just think about what we know about what has to be true in this circuit in the steady state. Okay, so I want you just to think for a minute, maybe make a sketch on your own paper here of, uh, of 
what the we know the drift speed of an electron in the steady state has to be the drift velocity of an electron um, at all, all these locations mark X. So steady state, remember what that means. Current constant throughout, value of current not changing. Okay, so I'm just going to give you just a moment to draw that, to think about that. Okay. So presumably you came up with something that looks kind of like this, where the the electrons are moving. So the blue arrows are the the velocity of electrons in the circuit. Constant current, constant cross-sectional area, constant velocity, they have to be moving in this pattern. And they can't be building up anywhere, so they really all have to be going at exactly the same speed. And they have to be following the wire. They can't be falling out of it. So given that, at these same locations, what does the electric field have to look like inside this circuit? Okay, so think about this for just a minute. If you if you were going to draw the electric field at each of these these locations where we've we put an electron, how would you draw it? Okay, so basically, if we're going to have the same drift speed everywhere, so same v so must imply the same electric field because, because drift speed equals mobility times electric field, right? So the electric field must just be the same throughout this circuit. And if we, this is, I'm going to use this picture because it's a better drawing than I can, than I can make. So presumably, this is what it has to look like in the steady state. what it must be. Okay. <clears throat> so we know what it's got to look like. Let's try to figure out how it gets that way. So let's start over and figure out what the battery does. Okay. So let's, let's start out assuming that the only excess charges are on the battery here. We know there's no charge, in, no net charge inside the wires. So if the battery, which look, looks kind of like a dipole, is the only source of electric field he, here in this situation, what would, the, what would the electric field just do to this dipole battery look like? And I realize that the, the bottom end of our mechanical battery is extremely close to this wire um, and just pretend it's a little farther away. <clears throat> pretend the plates on the capacitor are smaller. So at each mark at X, draw the electric field due to this dipole-like battery. OK, so we can start here because on, on, on this, this line here, the top part of the wire, we're on the axis of our dipole, right? And we know that the electric field on the axis of a dipole points um, along the axis. And so I'll draw electric field there. And now the electric field on this side, also pointing toward the, the dipole, is, is also going to point that way. It's actually OK to draw an electric field through objects. That's fine. But now these other locations are on the perpendicular axis of the dipole, right? And so we know how to work that out. So the electric field here points in that direction, and it's not as big as the electric field on the 
on the axis. And then as we get farther away, the electric field falls off pretty fast. <clears throat> so the electric field of the battery actually looks kind of like that, right? All right, well, that's not very encouraging because, or it can't be the whole story, because given that pattern of electric field, if this was, if this was in fact the electric field at those locations inside the wire, what would, what would the drift speed of the electrons look like at those locations? Definitely opposite the direction. Well, in some locations, it, it's, it's so it's going to be complicated, isn't it? So let's let's actually draw it. So at this location, the electric field is pretty big. The force on the electrons is going to be in the right direction. So so the electrons would be going that way, and here they'd be going that way, and, and that's that's kind of okay actually. They're they're going in the direction we need current to go. And so down here at the bottom at location five, the electrons would be moving opposite to the electric field, but their, their speed is a lot smaller than it is up at the top. So they're moving in the right direction, but the wrong speed. Now here we've got at location four, we've got a real problem because electrons are actually moving the wrong way. So so we'd have electrons moving uh, backwards in the wire. And here we'd have a bigger speed. They're, they're moving in appropriate direction, but, but the speeds are all wrong. We, we know the speeds all have to be constant. And we were really disturbed by this fact that electrons are, are actually moving the wrong way at this location. <clears throat> Well, let's actually just go with this for a minute. Um, so, so here's here's the pattern of so here's the pattern of field and. Um, and drift speed, but I want us to concentrate for a minute on these bins in the wire here. So by the, what do I mean? What do we mean by, so this, we'll call this the right bend of the wire and this is the left bend of the wire. And the question is, if this is really what's going on here, okay, if, if electrons, so we've got electrons, um, moving in this direction and here's let's focus on the left bend in the next tiny time interval um, the next interval tiny delta t whoops that's not what i meant to do there in that next time interval delta t what's going to happen what's going to be going on at the left bend of the wire Not is this what we want to happen, but just what's what's going to happen if if this is really the flow of current in this thing. Remember, we're talking about electrons moving here. Okay, let's see what you said. So you say that the left bend is actually going to become negative, <clears throat> and that's clearly exactly what's going to happen because we've got. We've got electrons moving in here. We've got electrons moving in here. We don't have any electrons moving out of here. So indeed, this left bend of the wire becomes, becomes negative. Now let's think about where that negative charge is going to be. Remember that excess charge, this is excess negative charge, and this is a conductor. So this excess negative charge is actually going to pile up on the surface of the wire. <clears throat> okay. 
So now we've got some excess negative charge. And what's going to happen to the what's going to happen to the right bend of the wire? Well, we've got we've got electrons flowing away from the right bend in the wire. So it looks like we're going to have a deficiency of negative charge here, aren't we? So we're going to have some of these positive atomic cores exposed again on the surface of the wire. So in, in a nanosecond or a fraction of a nanosecond or whatever our delta T was, we got some charge buildup on the surface of the wire. And now um, we have a new source of electric field. So let's, let's draw our charges here. We now have all this negative charge here and we've got this positive charge here. And those guys actually contribute to the electric field everywhere in this circuit. So let's focus just on location four for a minute, because four is kind of a problematic location because our electrons are going the wrong way. What's the direction of the electric field contributed by the right bend and the left bend at location four? So, so here's the question. Here's all this positive charge here. Here's all this negative charge here. We've already drawn the field due to the battery, but now we have a field due to these charges here. So we wanna know what's the direction of the field just due to these, these charges here at the bends at location four. So we have a new contribution to the field. Okay, well, I'm interested in your answer because it's not my answer. Um, so you said it would contribute zero. But I don't see that. So let's, let's try to work it out. Here are these positive, let's think about these positive charges here. So here's all this positive charge at location four. Looks to me like this positive charge is actually gonna make an electric field pointing away from the positive charge. And here's this negative charge. It looks to me like that's gonna make an electric field pointing away from the negative charge. So it looks to me like at this location, in addition to the field from the charges on the battery, we now have an additional field due to these charges that have piled up on the bends of the wire here. Like this, so that now the net field at this location, which is the sum of the field due to the charges on the battery, and the charges on the bends is actually going to be a little bit smaller. Still in the wrong direction, so charges are still going to keep moving in the wrong direction, but less. So do you have a question about that? Okay, so what we're going to get is charges keep building up until, just like the way a block polarizes until E is zero at equilibrium, charges build up until the electric field is the same everywhere in the circuit. And yes, that's right. It, it keeps going and until, yeah, exactly. It keeps going until, until the, the electric field of the bend, um, until it works out, this is, so this is, so this is called feedback. And it must, it ends up with a pattern of charge that's actually kind of complicated on the surface of this wire. So here we've got positive charges building up next to the battery and 
somewhat less positive charge and positive charge here and positive charge here. It's not just on the bends. We have negative charge here and negative charge here and negative charge here and negative charge here, building up until we get this pattern of charge and field that we know we need. So what we end up with is a pretty complicated situation in which the electric field inside our circuit is uniform in magnitude and follows the wire. And that is due to charges in and on the battery and charges that have piled up on the surface of the wire. And we'll explore that a little more next time. We'll look at a program that, um, that actually models that. And we also have a, a I don't know if I have time to do it next time. I'll try. We have a program that actually, um, a, 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 sorry, a video of a demo where we can actually detect this charge on the surface of wires in a high voltage circuit. Yeah, that's right. Basically, the circuit manipulates itself until it gets us the field it wants because if it's not in a steady state, charge is building up somewhere. And if charge builds up somewhere, it contributes a field. So it's basically the circuit manipulating itself until it gets into a sustainable situation. <clears throat> now, this is really fast. Um, <clears throat> you saw that when I, <clears throat> when I moved the bulb close to the batteries, the brightness of the bulb didn't change. And yet those wires are bending differently and whatnot. So these charge rearrangements are super fast. And that this 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 phase in which charge builds up and establishes the right field pattern is quite fast. It's called a transient, the transient phase <clears throat> goes to steady state. <clears throat> there is a small delay when you start a circuit, but it's on the order of. Uh, fractions of a nanosecond because it's due to how long it takes. There's a, certainly a small, a certain transient when you start a circuit, okay? So it doesn't establish the steady state right away. Current can start running almost instantly because um, information about the changes in electric field can propagate at the speed of light. So electrons in a wire a foot away from some other place might take it a nanosecond to learn that there's a new electric field, but it's the, it, the delays are that order, yeah. Okay, so answer one of two things in chat. Uh, what's the most important idea here or what are you still confused about? A short circuit means that you bypass something. So you've made a circuit and you've bypassed, you bypassed the bulb or something like that. What insulation does is it just stops the wire from touching another conductor because we know that electrons like to move from one conductor to another. So the insulation just stops electrons, the metal from touching another conductor. Um, Dr. Shabai? Yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm still a little bit lost on earlier in the lecture, you mentioned that um, a common misconception is that electrons just kind of push each other through the wires. Um, could you go explain again why that isn't necessarily the case? Like not, I, I understand that they don't like physically like touch um, and like push each other. Right. It's because the interior of the wire is neutral. So, so if you're thinking about an electron, so here's, here's our electron and here's another electron, and you say, well, there's certainly a force on the electron we're interested in by the one to the left of it. But what you're not thinking about is all the other stuff in the wire, which also exerts a force. So there's another electron over here, which is gonna exert a force back the other way. And then in addition, there are these, these positive atomic cores that exert forces on on all the on on this electron as well so it's it's attracted here and it's attracted there and it adds up 
when you when you add up all the force on your electron by all the other electrons and all the positive cores, it adds up that that force has to be zero. And so the but only isn't the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Isn't the electron ahead of it going to be like moving away from it as opposed to everything else is kind of standing still. So as the electron ahead of it moves away, that it kind of gets pushed forward because I don't know, I'm thinking it's like water moving. tension. They're all moving. Everybody's moving at the same speed. Okay, so in, in, in the scenario we're talking about, everybody's actually moving in in some in some direction here because we're talking about the steady state, right? So everybody's moving in some direction. And the the electron, mobile electron C is kind of not compressible because if you try to shove electrons closer together, they they won't go closer together. So 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 everybody's moving along at the same speed and they are losing energy. So where are they picking up energy? Is it from work done by an electron behind them? Well, no, because you, you, it, it's not the speed that influences the force, it's just the distance. And so if these electrons are evenly spaced, they're gonna, you know, electron one and electron two are gonna be exerting equal and opposite forces on your moving electron, plus all these positive things around. Okay, I, okay. I, I'm still a bit confused, but I think I might just have to think about this for a while. It, it does take some thinking. There is there is a discussion in the book. I don't know if it helps, but yeah, I guess I was. I guess I'm used to thinking about this as like the electrons are kind of like water going through a pipe, in or like a straw kind of thing. Like the reason they move forward is because there's a vacuum of them created by the battery ahead of them, so they kind of okay, like. That's, but let's try to use the physics concepts we know, which are force and force and field, right? So there's 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 forces, um, the water analogy isn't great for electric circuits. Um, right, right, right. But, but so forces are due to electric fields and then you have to think what are the sources of field? And so these other electrons are sources of field, um, but there's, there's lots of them. There's no place where there aren't any electrons. You know, we've got lots of electrons all over here. So there's lots of them. And, uh, and there's lots of positive charges too. So the, the force due to charges inside the wire ends up being zero. Okay. Um, another question, if you have time, was yeah. how, so. We, uh, am I understanding correctly that we were saying that the electric force? like the electric field around uh, pretty much the circuit is mostly caused at, at first before all the other buildup of charges, it's caused by the electric field of the battery? Well, we, we use that as a as sort of a, a thing, a, a, an example to think with. Now, um, so what we basically did is, is, is say, let's, let's, um, Consider right, let's consider this situation. And what we would have to do to get this situation is we'd have to actually freeze all the mobile electrons in the wire. Because the minute we get the wire close to the battery, it's actually being polarized by the battery already and charges are shifting around. So the as we move it, so so in our, our, our example here, we made it easy to think about by saying, let's pretend that we can freeze all the, the electrons in the wire and just look at the effects of the battery, okay? And then if we did that, we see that, if we do that, we see that we get currents flowing in, in directions that lead to charge buildup, okay? so we. Now, this is, this is really a thought experiment because we could never quite do that. <coughs> because as we put the wire, we even just bring the wire near the battery, it starts to polarize because of the field of the battery and charges are building up. So the, in a real situation, 
this all happens continuously. We just kind of broke it down this way because it's actually easier to see step by step what would have to happen. And there turns out to be only one possible solution for the charge distribution that that makes the right fields. And so um, it we get to the same answer this way as we would as to doing a, a different calculation. Okay. All right. I think I think I'm just gonna have to think about this. Yeah, it does take some thought. <laughs> Thank you. Yep.